بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام uh, عليكم and good afternoon uh, everybody uh, I'll be talking about uh, heart transplant uh, inshallah uh, so I will divide my objective into three main parts uh, including uh, a process of pre-operative uh, management um, then second part is operative uh, technique and uh, a last part is uh, result and uh, please feel, feel free to uh, interrupt or uh, if you have a question or uh, to add a point. Uh, so I thought it is uh, interesting to review some of the history of heart transplant and major step uh, in the advancement of heart transplant. Uh, so in the picture you see uh, the, no, uh, the known uh, French surgeon, uh, Alex Carrel, uh, who was considered a father of uh, transplant and uh, vascular anastomosis. Um, he started uh, to do first heterotropic uh, canine heart and animal, uh, which was in 1905. Later on, he was awarded for a uh, Nobel Prize uh, in 1912. Uh, things been slow after that till uh, almost 1946 where uh, a Russian, or uh, he was from a Soviet Union, uh, Vladimir Dimikov, uh, he advanced his uh, experiment on, on animal. So he was successfully implanting the first intrathoracic heterotropic uh, heart allograft. And this is part of his uh, uh, experiment. Uh, so you can see that he implanted another head to, uh, to a dog as well. Uh, <clears throat> later on, uh, in 1950, uh, Dr. Shamway and his group at Stanford uh, University um, successfully transplanted uh, orthotopic heart uh, in a dog uh, with cardiopulmonary bypass. They used the uh, immersion of the donor heart uh, for five minutes on four uh, degrees saline. And uh, Dr. Shamway and his group standardized uh, the surgical technique, uh, which has been used later on uh, for heart transplant. And they reported uh, five out of eight uh, animals survived six to 21 days without immune suppression. Um, another ad advancement was done by Dr. Uh, James Hardy in 1964 where he implanted a chimpanzee uh, xenograft uh, to a uh, human body. Uh, however, the, patient, the, the chimpanzee heart was unable to maintain uh, the circulatory load of the patient and uh, died. the patient died a uh, few hours later. And for that, he received a lot of uh, critiques uh, from uh, the scientific committee. Uh, Later on, in 1967, uh, South African uh, uh, surgeon Christian Bernard surprised the world with the first human-to-human -human, uh, heart transplant. You can see here my picture with uh, Dr. Christian Bernard at his office. Uh, this is not an actual Dr. Bernard. This is a, a kind of uh, wax uh, museum in Cape Town. Uh, where they depict every single moment during the first heart transplant, including the same operating room and uh, even the heart of the the recipient uh, was explanted and uh, saved. And he's, here's this is a picture of him visiting. Uh, he was hosted by uh, Saudi Arabia during that time. Uh, another uh, major advancement was uh, made by Phillips Cave in 1973, uh, where, where he introduced uh, endovascular uh, myocardial biopsy, uh, which give, uh, provide reliable uh, means of monitoring the rejection. And uh, till that time, was trans the transplant was uh, with not uh, uh, a good outcome, I would say. Uh, uh, later on, uh, in 1980, 81, uh, cyclosporin was uh, uh, 
introduced to medical field and was used uh, for after heart transplant, uh, which was the beginning of modern era of successful cardiac transplant. Before that, uh, they were using azathioprine and uh, corticosteroid with high rate of uh, rejection. And we can say we can see after that from around 1982, uh, the number of uh, heart transplant uh, uh, peaked till it plateaued after that. Uh, so, <clears throat> who's your recipient? How to choose your recipient? Uh, I would read this. This is the base. The basic objective of uh, choosing a recipient is to identify a relatively healthy patient with end-stage cardiac disease who is refractory to other medical and surgical therapies who have uh, potential to resume normal activity, active life and maintain compliance with medical regimen after cardiac tra tra transplantation. So here's your patient, uh, patient with end-stage heart disease that's not amenable or refractory to uh, uh, optimal medical and surgical therapy, and the one who you expect to resume his life after that uh, and to maintain compliance with the uh, post-operative regimen. Uh, recipient selection should be done with a multidisciplinary team and we'll discuss that uh, a few slides uh, later. So what's the indication for a heart transplant? Uh, we, can see, uh, we can see many indication. Uh, first of all, systolic uh, heart failure um, with different etiology, ischemic, idiopathic, valvular, um, this is the first uh, indication. Second indication is intractable uh, angina uh, that's not amenable to revascularization and uh, after optimal, remain symptomatic after optimal medical therapy. Um, <clears throat> also intractable arrhythmia, uh, also that is not candidate for ablation therapy or failed uh, medical and uh, endovascular therapy. Um, Fourth one is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and who remains symptomatic. Congenital heart disease uh, with uh, in which fixed pulmonary hypertension is not a complication. Cardiac tumor and restrictive cardiomyopathy. This is the indication. However, in terms of uh, statistics, here we can see the number of patients from 1982 to 2018 where uh, majorities uh, are non-ischemic cardiomyopathy or dilated and idiopathic cardiomyopathy. And around 40% is ischemic cardiomyopathy. And uh, the remaining percentage between one to four, uh, the other reason. This is uh, around the last uh, 10 years. Um, minor change actually in, in, the, in the statistics with decreased number of ischemic cardiomyopathy and increasing of uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. <clears throat> this was the indication. And for uh, contraindication, uh, there is absolute and relative contraindication. Absolute contraindication is uh, age more than 65 to 75. However, this uh, may differ between center according to experience and uh, clinical situation. Uh, Fixed pulmonary hypertension, however, uh, is considered uh, acceptable uh, absolute contraindication when you have a patient with pulmonary vascular resistance more than six and transpulmonary gradient more than 15. Uh, other uh, contraindication is a systemic illness with limit uh, survival despite transplant. Uh, remember, the objective is to uh, to transplant a patient, uh, you expect from him to return to his normal life and uh, maintain compliance. And since those patients have, uh, would receive uh, autoimmune disease, uh, sorry, would receive uh, immune suppressive uh, medication, so the risk of uh, new blasm, HIV activation, SLE autoimmune disease uh, will be higher on those patients. However, when talking about uh, age, uh, remember, it's uh, controversial. Uh, it's different from center to center. 
uh, but one should concentrate on physiologic rather than chronological age. Um, and uh, one study was uh, showing that older patients have lower risk of rejection. So they have uh, less rejection in soy, but having also uh, non uh, post transplant lymphoproliferative disorder uh, cancer. Um, I think in uh, our institute, King Faisal, uh, uh, the, the eldest patient uh, was a 62 uh, year old lady. And she did fine, alhamdulillah. Uh, here we can say the, see the age of, uh, of recipient uh, by years. You can see the majority of patient lies between 40 to uh, less than 60. And this is the uh, median age. Uh, there's slight increase uh, on median age. Uh, recently, it's around 53. And you can see some patients were transplanted above, above 70 year old. So uh, the other absolute contraindication is said fixed pulmonary hypertension. So more than six units and transpulmonary gradient uh, more than 15 are acceptable absolute contraindication. Uh, however, uh, you need to assess uh, reversibility before diagnosing the patient with fixed pulmonary hypertension using uh, dilator like sodium nitroproside, adenosine, medrinone, or inhaled uh, nitric oxide. And uh, the result you want to see in terms of reversibility is decline on uh, pulmonary vascular resistance, uh, 2.5 uh, units, or at least 50% of the baseline. Uh, this should be uh, with maintenance of adequate systemic, uh, systemic systolic blood pressure during uh, examining the patient. Um, also another important uh, advance on the uh, term of fixed pulmonary hypertension, uh, the use of left ventricular assist device uh, can uh, reduce uh, the pulmonary hypertension. This is uh, one study. Uh, they showed that patient with uh, wh whose uh, bridge with the uh, LVAD have uh, will have baseline of 43 plus minus. Uh, this is the main pulmonary artery pressure was dropped to 22 uh, post LVAD. Uh, pulmonary vascular resistance was 6.3 uh, is the median 6.3 uh, unit and was dropped to 2.2. And this was maintained even after transplant uh, for one year. So this is a promising uh, solution in those patients. <clears throat> However, the, there is potential contraindication. Uh, recent malignancy uh, is one of the reasons. Uh, usually you would like to have a patient who is free from a cancer for five years uh, at least. Um, other uh, potential contraindication is diabetes with end stage uh, end organ damage, uh, peripheral vascular disease, active or recent infection, other systemic illness, um, patient with osteoporosis, and active alcohol or uh, drug abuse. Uh, infection is usually considered a potential contraindication uh, for general patient. However, uh, with LVAD patient, remember that around up to 48 of the patient uh, uh, will, will uh, have later on a drive line or any kind of infection. So this is the exception. Uh, in patient with LVAD uh, infection, uh, actually it's, it's better to proceed with urgent transplantation. This is the only solution of uh, those patients after failed uh, antibiotic and medical therapy. Um, also, important point is uh, since those patients will need uh, um, a lot of uh, immunosuppressive medication, a lot of uh, clinic visit with routine endomyocardial biopsy. So, history of, physical, of psychiatric illness or substance abuse or even non compliance could be a sufficient cause to reject uh, the patient from a transplant list. Uh, also, lack of uh, social support and uh, 
financial support could be a relative uh, contra contraindication and should be taken uh, into account. <clears throat> so you have a patient with uh, uh, with uh, reasonable indication how how you're going to evaluate this potential recipient. So as we mentioned, this team approach involved uh, different specialty. Uh, and it's guided by comprehensive and detailed history and uh, physical examination, some labs and imaging study, and multiple level assessment. So uh, the proposed uh, laboratory study, you need to do com complete uh, blood count with differential liver and kidney uh, function, um, electrolytes, lipid panel, and uh, a screen for autoimmune disease as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, mammogram and pap smear for uh, female more than 40, prostate specific antigen for male more than 50. Uh, this is in terms of general laboratory. Regarding the cardiac, uh, cardiac evaluation, uh, you need 12 bleed ECG and halter monitoring echocardiogram. And uh, in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy, you need also to assist, uh, is there a room for uh, revascularization before uh, proceeding with the heart transplant? Another important uh, study is uh, VO2 max, and uh, right and left heart side cath. Biopsy in patients who is having uh, a not, uh, not a clear uh, diagnosis to establish the etiology of heart failure and also to, uh, to assist the pulmonary hypertension status. You need to do a peripheral vascular study, renal, just X-ray pulmonary function test. Uh, you screen for any GI uh, symptom and uh, investigate that. Uh, neurological, if you have any question of history of CVA or uh, TIA, Psychiatric evaluation also is important because you need uh, compliance with the patient after that. Uh, dental evaluation. And this is what we said, it's, it's a, a multi-team approach, multidisciplinary approach. Uh, so involving all, also the physical therapy for uh, evaluation and uh, rehabilitation, social worker for family support and you know, financial resource and the transplant coordinator uh, as well for uh, education of the patient and what's expected from him post-transplant. So what's your objective from the, those previous evaluation? It's to predict the patient's survival so you can uh, prioritize them on the waiting list. And two uh, strongest predictor for mortality found to be ejection fraction less than 20 and reduce VO2 max less than 14. Also, when you, when you check the patient head to toe, you want to look for any contraindication for uh, transplant to offer uh, this uh, precious organ to uh, one who can uh, maximally benefit uh, from it. Dr. Faisal? Yes, بالنسبة للإيجكشن فراكشن الآن البيشنس يعني يعني مو مو most of them يعني they have أصلا decrease يعني decrease ejection fraction ف how come it is a reduction يعني طيب إحنا شفنا indication إنه not all the patients are systolic systolic heart failure some of them are restrictive restrictive cardiomyopathy and congenital however in the study pool or the all the indication it's found that reduced ejection fraction and VO2 max is the strongest predictor for poor outcome post-op. So that's why those patients, the one with reduced ejection fraction and with reduced VO2 max, you need to prioritize uh, them on the list. Otherwise, they are they, if you put them late on the list, they will die probably within the uh, waiting time. Okay? Yeah, you mean they are a priority? Yes, exactly. That's why you, you need to bring patient survival to prioritize them. Uh -huh. okay. okay, I see, I see. Uh, <clears throat> so how to prepare your patient, uh, the potential recipient? Uh, some of those patients are critically ill 
and require ICU admission with uh, anaerobic therapy to maintain uh, their hemodynamics, also arrhythmia management. Uh, fluid uh, overload is also important because to affect the patient post-op and optimize organ perfusion to prevent any deterioration in uh, other organ and uh, nutritional support as uh, some of the patient will have uh, cardiac ataxia. Other mean of uh, intervening for those patients is use uh, mechanical bridging. This can be by intraortic balloon pump or ECMO if they are really sick. And uh, also important advancement is uh, using the LVAD support. And it was uh, obvious uh, by the landmark study rematch trial, which showed around 30% difference uh, between the LVAD patient and uh, medic optimal medical management in term of death of any cause waiting for transplant. So 50% uh, of around 50-52 of patients with optimal medical therapy died within one year of heart, of, uh, of, uh, heart failure. <clears throat> However, patients who was bridged uh, with LVAD, uh, the mortality was around 20-22%. Um, other mean of support is using total artificial heart, uh, especially for patients with uh, biventricular failure and uh, ventricular arrhythmias. And we can see here from the data that uh, increasing number of patients now are uh, bridging with uh, LVAD or mechanical security support, where LVAD uh, was the most mean of support for those patients, and the remaining are. Uh, different kind of support. <clears throat> uh, now uh, you evaluate your patient, you choose your patient uh, according to the indication, then uh, you evaluate and bridge uh, those patients with optimized medical therapy or mechanical support. Now how you prioritize them uh, uh, on the transplant. So it's mainly based on quality of life expected to be gained uh, after that and uh, mortality as well. Um, you, uh, remember that you need to <clears throat> evaluate uh, your patient uh, at least every three months, or even less in patients who are really uh, uh, poor, uh, uh, poor candidate, or I mean uh, poor hemodynamic, like patient on ECMO, and those you need to do it every 15 days or every one week. And the uh, early right side heart cath is also indicated uh, in the waiting list, uh, looking for uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension status. So this is the criteria uh, for uh, for uh, prioritizing the patient by um, United uh, um, United uh, Nation of Organ Sharing. Uh, this is a new uh, a new criteria. This was proposed in 2016 and was. Uh, uh, applied uh, in 2018 and later on. So <clears throat> they div divided the patient into six status. Uh, the, uh, number one is the highest uh, priority and they need urgent uh, transplant where uh, six is uh, least on the list. And we can see that patient on ECMO or non-dischargeable uh, VAD, patient with the life-threatening ventricular arrhythmia and mechanical support, they have the priority. And uh, yeah, accordingly, you can uh, you see that mo they are more stable patient uh, later on. Um, and this was meant to uh, reduce the uh, waiting uh, mortality on transplant uh, list. This is the comparison between the old one, which was in 2006, and this is the new one in 2018. So it was 1A and 1B and 2. Now it's six uh, classes according to the severity. <clears throat> uh, however, uh, this new uh, new system uh, received uh, also a lot of, of critiques uh, from the medical co uh, community. We can see this uh, new study was done to evaluate this new allocation system. Um, the red is the new system and uh, uh, the blue is the old system. And uh, this is the mortality uh, on time. This is almost uh, like a short-term uh, short outcome. 
and we can see that patient with in, in the newer system they have uh, reduced uh, survival of those patients uh, yes uh, you, you 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 transplant the sicker patient earlier however their outcome is not uh, as good as the previous outcome you reduce the mortality in the waiting list uh, but the post of uh, post of uh, outcome is questionable Uh, so now almost we finish from the recipient. Now we go for the donor. Uh, how you evaluate and select uh, the donor. So once uh, you receive the call from uh, uh, organ donation uh, agency, uh, and once a brain dead individual has been identified as a potential uh, cardiac donor, usually there are three phase of screening. So the primary screening is by organ recruitment agency. They will send you the information regarding the age, height, weight, gender, uh, blood group, hospital course, and cause of death, and some of the major uh, uh, laboratory labs. So you review that if the patient passed the uh, primary screening, then you go for secondary screening, which is usually done by the cardiac surgeon or cardiologist. Uh, <clears throat> the aim of this uh, screening is to uh, search for potential contraindication and determine the hemodynamic support necessary to sustain uh, th this patient. And you proceed with the EKG, uh, chest X-ray, ABG, and ECO. Uh, in some patient, coronary angiograph is uh, indicated, especially for male donor more than 45 or female more than 50. Uh, this in general. However, if you have a patient with history of cocaine use or uh, who have three risk factors for coronary artery disease, you need to do uh, uh, coronary angio before uh, accepting this patient. So this is some suggested uh, criteria uh, for a donor. Uh, it's been suggested that age should be less than 50 to 60, uh, absence of prolonged cardiac arrest, severe hypertension, uh, intracardiac drug injection, chest trauma, septicemia, and all other uh, reasons. Uh, so, suggested evaluation, we mentioned that. Uh, now, the patient uh, passed the first two scre uh, screening phase. The final screening uh, care intraoperatively, where the cardiac uh, recruitment team. Uh, do intraoperatively. Uh, this involves direct visualization for evidence of any trauma, any dysfunction, uh, valvular or ventricular dysfunction, infarction, myocardial confusion. Also, the coronary artery tree is uh, palpated for uh, gross calcification. <coughs> uh, however, okay, this is the standard criteria for a uh, potential donor. However, sometimes uh, you can, you can uh, extend the donor criteria or what's called alternative list. Some center will have uh, two lists, one standard list for the standard patient and another expanded uh, donor where you use marginal donor for marginal recipient. Um, which, which means that use donor smaller than recipient size donor with the uh, some coronary artery disease that require maybe one single cabbage or with moderate uh, LV dysfunction and older age group. Uh, using that is better than uh, the, uh, the donor heart will be wasted uh, otherwise. And this is um, a new study for 10 year experience with uh, alternative uh, criteria and we can see this is the alternative criteria and this is the standard criteria outcome. This is for 10 years. Yes, it's differ, but it's, it's not that uh, bad, I think, rather than uh, keeping the patient dying in the waiting and in the, uh, without uh, transplant. So uh, now you decided this is a good donor, how you manage this uh, donor till, uh, till the transplant uh, day comes. Usually this is uh, a bit complicated. 
because you need to coordinate with other organ donor team like a liver team like a lung team and because of the physiological phenomena of uh, brain death so those patients usually uh, once uh, their brain died they have severe autonomic and cytokine strong uh, strong storm sorry so release uh, usually associated with release of norepinephrine with associated hypertension and vasoconstriction with subendocardial ischemia that could uh, cause myocardial depression. Also, uh, cytokines can affect, uh, alter the myocardial depression even more with the uh, pronounced vasodilatory effect and loss of temperature control. So those patients usually <clears throat> have intense autonomic activity earlier, then that's followed by loss of uh, sympathetic tone and uh, profound vasodilation. So uh, fluid overload is, uh, should be avoided in those patients that uh, could affect the cardiac uh, function. So your aim is to maintain a map of 60 or more <clears throat> with a CVB of between six to 10. Uh, maintaining normal temperature is important, electrolyte levels, acid base balance and oxygenation. Also maintaining a blood glucose level between 120 to 180 in the uh, potential donor. Um, some center will use a uh, hormonal resuscitation package that includes methylprednisolone, um, thyroidine, and vasopressin, which showed in some study that it's improved the function and improved a uh, later outcome. Also, broad spectrum antibiotics should be used after uh, collecting uh, ban culture from the patient. So, you did all that. Now, you want to see if, uh, if the donor is uh, matching your uh, recipient or not. So this usually uh, depend on uh, blood grouping compatibility first, that should not be crossed. Uh, another thing is the anti-HLA antibody cross match. We'll talk about it later on. And patient size. So you want uh, a donor, uh, this in general, donor weight should be within 30% of the recipient weight. For example, if you have, um, 100 kilogram uh, recipient, you will accept a patient uh, with the 30% above or below uh, this weight. So if the recipient is 100, you will accept from 70 to 130 kilogram uh, recip uh, donor, I mean. However, in some cases, uh, a larger donor is preferred, especially patient who have higher pulmonary vascular resistance. This will help the uh, RV uh, post op <clears throat> also, uh, there is many uh, patient sizing uh, uh, method. Um, this was the general one is to use 30%. Other one is uh, to use a predicted uh, heart mass. You can calculate it and see the difference. Um, also, some people using uh, body surface area, BMI, and uh, height as well. ما ادري دكتور فريد اذا اعرف انه عندك بابليكيشن ان ذس ريجارد ريجاردنج ذا بيشنت سايز دونر اف يو وونت تو اد اني ثينك سو جست لايك يو مينشن وي هاف ا بروبلم وذ جيتنج انف دونرز اند ذير فور يو ماي هاف تو كومبرومايز اند يوز مارجينال دونرز فور مارجينال بيشنت one of the criteria that we use for kids is the size of the, uh, of the heart uh, related to the chest size of the patient, of the recipient. And uh, the only clue that we use is the size of the, um, of the donor uh, in general, uh, but more, uh, it has been found that the height is more important than the, the BMI or the weight of the patient. Even with that, we still have uh, quite a bit of discrepancy. Um, in one patient, we elected to override that uh, discrepancy because we took actual measurement of the heart and actual measurement of the uh, uh, recipient chest, and we decided that we can take it. The patient uh, did well and survived. Uh, it's a case report. But, but this is only one aspect of 
marginal pa uh, patients. And I'm, I'm sure that there will be a lot of uh, issue that can be challenged to expand your uh, donor pool. Um, most importantly, what is happening recently, and I'm not sure if any of the guys, I think uh, the, the Dr. Hudeib have talked to me about this and we initiated some initial work on this. I'm not sure how far it will go, but, but it is interesting. And yes, we are pushing the, the envelope, uh, the limits uh, to use more and more uh, marginal hearts. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> so in terms of anti-HLA antibody, so <clears throat> elevated level of uh, reactive, uh, performed uh, reactive antibody or panel reactive antibody to HLA uh, associated with higher rate of uh, organ rejection and decreased survival uh, post-transplant. So uh, before proceeding with transplant, uh, type of cross-matching should be done either to see the patient negative. So if you have a negative cross match, this is a good result. You want to proceed with the transplant. If you have a positive, then it's uh, questionable and sometimes uh, contraindication. Uh, it's by taking the tissue from a patient and uh, add it to the, from the donor and add it to the uh, recipient uh, serum and uh, see if there is a reaction antibody uh, uh, reaction. Uh, however, this uh, actual cross-matching can be time-consuming. Sometimes you have a patient here in uh, the recipient in Riyadh and uh, a donor in, uh, on, uh, for example, Dammam. Uh, so a new advancement was uh, using uh, a virtual uh, cross-match where you take a tissue from the patient, usually uh, through a buccal swab and you cross-match it uh, with the, you already have the, your patient recipient serum, and you can virtually cross-match uh, those, uh, those things, and uh, it's have even higher sensitivity and specificity. And it takes uh, 10 minutes to do virtual cross-matching, plus the collection and uh, this process. <clears throat> so now you are happy with the whole process. Now you want to proceed with the, with the surgery itself. Um, any question regarding the previous slides or, or proceed with the transplant uh, technique? Dr. Faisal, معلش تعيد النقطة حقت the virtual هذه اللي بيعملوها. طيب. Previous, you have to do actual uh, cross match where you take uh, from the patient uh, serum, the donor and recipient, and cross match it with each other. Uh, to look for any um, antigen antibody reaction that will affect uh, later outcome and even immediate outcome post op. Um, so, however, recently they are using virtual cross match, which showed higher sensitivity, sensitivity and specificity. So, what they do, they take uh, a swab, usually buccal swab, from the donor, and you already have the recipient serum. And you know, you analyze the recipient serum uh, for um, antibodies. And you cross match it with the DNA antigen uh, with the donor. So you will see if there is any cross reaction between them or not. And if there is uh, more than 10% or so, this is considered a contraindication for transplant. Tamam, clear. Okay, now we we'll proceed with the surgery. Uh, first is the donor uh, recruitment. Uh, it's usually done through median sternotomy, uh, usually extended up to uh, pubis for the if there is the abdominal organ to be harvested. Pericardium then is open. Uh, then you start doing what we said the third phase of uh, evaluation. So you will inspect and palpate for evidence of any disease or injury. So once you are happy with the, with the result, either there is positive result or negative, you have to communicate it with the transplant team so they can proceed uh, to, to, I mean, uh, to manage the time for a recipient to be sent to OR. So after you communicate with the transplant team at your hospital, you start mobilizing the SVC, IVC, and azogas vein circumferentially and encircle them with tie. Uh, to prepare them. Uh, also, you 
the aorta and pulmonary artery are uh, isolated with the umbilical tape. Uh, after that, usually the, the cardiac uh, team will uh, drive from the operating table to facilitate for the abdominal organ team and uh, lung team to, uh, to proceed with the dissection. And usually it take up to four to five minutes, sometime one hour. <clears throat> so once they are ready, they will call you back. Uh, so you start with administering 330,000 uh, units of fibrin for anticoagulation. Uh, during that time, you do burst string and the ascending aorta for cardioplegia needle. Um, once uh, everybody is ready, you communicate with other uh, organ uh, harvesting team. So once everybody is ready, then you start tying the azygous uh, vein and the SPC. You ligate them and uh, you divide distal to the azygous vein. So you want to take uh, the higher uh, the higher length or the long, uh, the higher length uh, as possible. Um, after that, you uh, incise the IVC. Uh, this is the area debate between uh, liver team and uh, heart team. So usually around the diaphragm is a uh, good estimation. However, you need to agree with the liver team what length uh, to go with. So you incise the IVC. And by that, you, you are venting the right side. And the same time after that, directly you go to vent uh, the left side, usually by uh, sizing the left atrial appendage or uh, by uh, transected the pulmonary vein in case of, uh, of the, if the lung is uh, not harvested. So left atrial appendage in case of the lung is harvested. Uh, because you want to keep the pulmonary vein intact for them. Or uh, if there is no lung to be uh, harvested, then you can transect the, one of the pulmonary veins. So you now you vented the, the right side, left side, and uh, you dissect the SPC and IVC. Now you uh, put your aortic cross clamp distally, just before the uh, innominate artery you start uh, cardioplegia, usually one liter of cardioplegia. At the same time, you fill the, the pericardium with uh, cold saliva and slush for uh, rapid uh, cooling. So here we can see uh, you dissect the azygos and SPC as high as possible, also the IVC. You cross clamp. At the same time, you should be venting the uh, left atrium. It's also important to look for uh, and avoid any LV distinction and make sure the uh, heart is cooled with the uh, cold saliva and slush. So after uh, delivery... Uh, Faisal, you, you think before cross clamp or after the cross clamp? No, before. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, after delivery of cardioplegia, you complete your cardioplegia, you, you proceed with the cardiectomy. Um, so, maybe let's see it in the picture. So, you already have uh, transected this PC and IVC. Uh, so, what you do is uh, you elevate the, the heart from the apex, uh, cephalic way, and you start. Uh, cutting the pulmonary veins. This in case of the lung is not used. Okay, you can cut through the pulmonary veins. Um, uh, then after that, you transect the aorta above the, uh, as high as possible, and uh, pulmonary artery as well at, at the bifurcation. However, in case of the lung is, uh, is harvested, uh, what you will do is, uh, this is the apex elevated. You want to avoid uh, cutting through the pulmonary veins. So you cut through, other picture. So you start to cutting, uh, cut uh, above the pulmonary veins here, okay? Uh, making sure to avoid any injury to, to the pulmonary veins. So what's remaining on the donor chest is the left arterial cup with intact uh, 
uh, pulmonary veins. This is also an important step. Also, usually, this is the debate between lung transplant team and heart transplant team because they want uh, some cuff and intact pulmonary veins, and you also want um, sufficient uh, left atrial cuff. So it will be between you and them. You just cut um, above the pulmonary veins uh, to maintain them. Um, alternative, you can, uh, as we say, divide SVC, IVC, and aorta, and pulmonary, then leaving the left atrium um, at the last uh, stage. This may be better uh, visualization uh, for the left atrium. So now you remove the heart from the donor uh, chest. You take it carefully and place it in the basin of cold saline. Uh, you inspect it and prepare it, looking for any PFO. And if it's there, you, you need to close it. Also for any vascular uh, injury you have made or inadequate length. And if there is anything of that, you have to communicate with the, with the implanting surgeon. So he will prepare himself for uh, if you need a batch or uh, a longer graft. <clears throat> So once you are happy with the, with the heart, you put the heart in, in two sterile bowel bag, uh, each uh, filled with cold saline and uh, airtight container, and you put it in the standard cooler for ice transport. So this is a topic of organ uh, preservation. So most center will use uh, hypothermic uh, cardioplegia and um, store in four to 10 degrees centigrade. This is a preferred method for most uh, transplant. And this allow you a ischemic uh, period of four to six hour. Um, however, a new advancement uh, came uh, recently is using what called organ care system. Uh, this is uh, one example by Transmedic, uh, Transmedics. Uh, this is an uh, organ care system in which you can put the heart here and uh, the heart will be preserved in 34 degrees centigrade uh, with the pulsatile flow. Okay, and you can uh, here uh, uh, look for the <clears throat> different, uh, different uh, blood uh, pressure, uh, either perfusion pressure, coronary pressure, and aortic pressure. Also, you can uh, check for the lactate and other parameter. Okay. However, uh, there is disadvantage, which is the cost. Uh, usually, the console itself around 180,000 uh, euro. And uh, for each transplant for the disposable uh, kit, you need 30,000. Uh, uh, 30,000 uh, euro compared to around 110 euro for the regular uh, standard uh, technique. So yes, it have the advantage of uh, preserving the heart. Uh, however, it's uh, a bit costly. And it needs special training in terms of how to prepare the heart, uh, surgical technique, and how to implant it, and how to maintain it. And uh, it's been studied uh, in, in many study and uh, approve its efficacy. Uh, it was some clinical trial was done and showed uh, non-inferiority. And even some studies showed even lower episode of rejection uh, of acute renal failure and shorter uh, hospital stay. Uh, and some metabolic, uh, preferred metabolic effect was found uh, also in those patients. Um, and the main, the main uh, advantage is to expand uh, the ischemic time. Um, the longest study I found is uh, using this uh, care system up to 10 and a half hour uh, for, to preserve the heart. And the patient was transplanted after that. Yes, he needed ECMO earlier in post op but he was discharged home uh, after 18 days and uh, the follow-up was uh, excellent after that.
So this is the advantage. Now you can uh, expand your uh, transplant pool and also it can help in uh, expanding the criteria. So you can bring in the heart and assist the heart contractility and everything. And you can even do cath for uh, those patients. Um, we have then uh, two patients. Uh, one of them, the heart was not used uh, in our hospital but we did for him a cath uh, while it's in the console. So it's interesting, the advancement in this field. <coughs> yeah, I know this, uh, while the organ in the uh, organ perfusion system, this time all the uh, coronaries are perfused, now it's considered an ischemic time or uh, it's counted as a part of ischemic time, right? Yes, it's ischemic time, but it's not called ischemia. Yeah, no. Uh, Faisal, yeah. uh, I should call this ischemic time from aortic cross clamp to aortic cross clamp or in the middle, middle. Yeah, once you uh, call this ischemic time, once you remove uh, the heart from the donor and put it in the, uh, put it on the, once you remove, when you start cutting cardiectomy, till you re implant it, you start re implanting. So this is the called uh, ischemic time. And the warm ischemic. I think, Faisal, from once you put the cross clamp on the donor till you yeah. release the cross clamp on the recipient. This is the cross clamp time. Uh, yes, that's right. That's called ischemia time. Yes. That's right. Since you start the cardioplegia, the cardioplegia, this is the, you're starting your cold ischemia. Will you re-implant it and release for reperfusion? Fine. Uh, <clears throat> now for the recipient, um, it's mainly two stage. One is the preparation of the uh, the heart and cardiectomy, then the implantation. Um, so preparing the recipient again, usually median sternotomy and vertical cardiectomy, heparinized and prepare for bypass. Our cannulation is inserted just proximal to the region of the artery and by cable cannulation. Uh, then you put uh, umbilical tape snare around the SBC and IBC and you separate the aorta from uh, pulmonary artery. So once the donor heart arrived, usually once it's arrived to the hospital, you start uh, your bypass and you snare your cable uh, snare. Um, you cross the, uh, cross clamp the aorta, and you start uh, cutting. Usually the aorta, then uh, main pulmonary artery, transect just above the semilunar valve, so to maintain a, a good length, so you can adapt for that. Also, SPC and IVC uh, are transected. <coughs> After that, you left atrium is inter anterior to pulmonary veins and incised along the atrioventricular group to leave adequate cuff for implantation. The same we did for, for the donor. So you cut through the left atrium cuff. Uh, by the way, I'm talking about the bicable technique, which is uh, probably the most, uh, the most common technique now used. So, uh, you, you cut already the all great vessels, then, uh, then you cut through the left atrium. And uh, also you should take care to avoid injury to especially the left side uh, pulmonary veins when you're excising uh, the left atrium. Then you, you place your sucker in the usually left atrium remnant. This will keep uh, the field free of blood and flood the operative field with CO2. Uh, now, um, uh, one critical thing is the uh, timing uh, between donor and recipient cardiectomy. Uh, ideally, the cardiectomy is completed at the time of allograft arrived. Because you don't want to cut the recipient heart and you're still not sure if anything could uh, go wrong. So usually once the, the heart on, on, on the hospital, or uh, in the hospital, you start the bypass and you start cutting and doing uh, your preparation. And also some center will have protocol of mandatory five uh, telephone call. Uh, 
first one when the team arrive at the harvest at the harvest site and assist the donor. Next, after visualization of the organ in the operating room, then before cross clamp at the harvest site. Uh, next, uh, on leaving the remote site, and finally when arriving locally. So this is very critical and important step uh, for the coordination. Uh, <clears throat> and also, it's, uh, recently, it's even more important, especially uh, large uh, number of patients are uh, redos and LVAD, and they need time for dissection. So now the heart is in the operating room, the donor heart. You start preparing uh, the heart. You remove it from the transport cooler. Uh, you start connecting the pulmonary veins if it was uh, transected with the uh, harvest to connect them to have a good uh, atrial cuff. Uh, also, you adjust for the sizing, this uh, any discrepancy between the uh, the donor and the recipient uh, cuff. Uh, usually at that time you cross clamp. It's depends from center to center. In our center, we usually cross clamp and give cardioplegia at that time, cold blood cardioplegia. Um, right. So implantation usually start by uh, implanting the left atrial cuff. Um, usually, double arm uh, for oprolin is started. You in the recipient um, in the recipient cuff. You start from this angle, just uh, near to the left superior pulmonary vein, and uh, the other end will go through uh, left, uh, also at the same place, just at the base of uh, left atrial appendage. Okay. Uh, then you either take a few suture down or you just directly put the heart down on the mediastinum of the recipient. And you start uh, running suture, uh, going downward, then uh, inferiorly, reaching up to here in the interatrial septum. This is the first, uh, first line. Then you start uh, running the other line also here till they meet uh, here and you can secure them and tie them. Uh, and while you are doing this, any size discrepancy, you should, uh, should be assessed and corrected accordingly. <clears throat> then after you complete the left atrial cuff, you move to um, IVC. Uh, it's usually done uh, end-to-end uh, -end anastomosis using four all bony suture. Uh, this is probably the most difficult anastomosis of all uh, the heart transplant. And I read some surgeon doing it uh, from the right side of the table. Um, so you finish uh, the IVC starting from the posterior wall, uh, then run to uh, anterior wall. You go for SVC, also using five all suture or four all suture. Um, also, it's advisable to, to look at the posterior uh, row, you, to look your suture to avoid any bursting uh, effect in the SVC and IVC. Uh, then you do end-to-end uh, -end pulmonary artery anastomosis. Again, for starting from posterior wall, uh, then anterior wall. Uh, it's also important, especially in the pulmonary artery anastomosis, to appoint any redundancy that can cause uh, kinking that will lead later on to RV dysfunction. Once you reach that stage, you are you left only with the aortic anastomosis. You start to warm, and end-to-end -end aortic anastomosis is performed in the same manner that done for pulmonary artery. <clears throat> so before you tie your aortic anastomosis, you ask the anesthesia to blow on the lung. Uh, and manipulate the heart to facilitate the de-airing uh, through the, your suture line, and then you can tie. However, uh, some changes, if, if the patient is uh, having prolonged ischemia time and you want to release the cross clamp as soon as possible, uh, you can start uh, with the left atrial cuff, it's usually always the first one. Then you do the aortic anastomosis, uh, second one and release cross clamp and you do the rest of anastomosis uh, uh, on uh, on a beating heart. It, it will be a little bit uh, messy, but you avoid the prolonged cross clamp. 
uh, then you start uh, de-airing. You, uh, you, you um, remove the snare from the cable and you start uh, de-airing uh, the heart. Some center also will give uh, another cardioplegia shot before removing the cross clamp. Uh, you start your uh, uh, weaning. It's also important to put atrial ventricular pacing wire and uh, patient weaned from bypass uh, gradually. And it's important for the cardiac surgeon uh, to uh, work closely with the, his anesthesiologist uh, to assess any metabolic derangement and correcting them uh, early. Uh, <clears throat> also, the volume resuscitation is important. You don't want uh, to overload the patient, especially to avoid RV dysfunction. And at the same time, we do want the heart to be underfilled. Uh, this is the basic and standard technique, which is uh, by cable. Um, there is other alternative technique, like by atrial technique, heterotropic uh, heart transplantation or heart transplantation on patient with LVAD. So there is some modification, but I prefer to put the standard one. And uh, you can read about the other alternative technique. Uh, now, th there were a debate between which is better, by atrial or by cable uh, transplant. So this is a recent uh, systematic review and meta-analysis was published in 2020, uh, February this year. And uh, they compared uh, the outcome of uh, the difference between by atrial and by cable. Uh, in terms of early mortality, um, there is some trend toward better uh, favor by cable. However, it's not uh, significant. It's touching the, the line. Uh, however, in terms of early moderate to severe uh, tricuspid regurg, uh, it's showing a better outcome. Less tricuspid regurg on by cable group. And also, it's the same for mitral as well. It's, it's better on the mitral. In term of uh, permanent pacemaker implantation, uh, by cable was uh, superior. Um, a long-term survival over 10 years uh, was studied, and the by cable is in the red uh, color and uh, by atrial in uh, blue color. And you can see the difference. It's, uh, the by cable showing a superior uh, outcome in term of uh, survival. <clears throat> this was regarding the surgical technique. Now regarding um, the result, you can see here uh, a median survival care for the patient uh, divided, divided uh, by uh, era. This is the new era here. Okay, this is the, each one is the eldest uh, era or older uh, era. Uh, so we can see the median survival up to 50% 50, 50 of patients will survive up to uh, 12 and a half year with good early outcome reaching one year survival of 90% uh, or so. So, and we are showing uh, and it showed a better outcome with the advancement in autoimmune and, uh, and better selection and bridging as well. And this is the median survival. You can see the improvement 8.6, 10.5, 12.5. And waiting for this line to hopefully continue this way. <laughs> uh, so what is the incid incidence of, uh, what are the risk for uh, death uh, or cause of uh, death uh, post-operatively? It's divided here by, uh, by period. The first, uh, first 30 days, then um, up to one year, three years. We can see higher on the list is a graft failure for the yearly outcome. Later on, the infection uh, came. And renal failure and multi-organ, this renal failure and multi-organ failure uh, came after that. So early rejection or graft failure in general uh, count for around 35% of early death. <clears throat> This is the cumulative incidence uh, of leading cause of death over years. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, is the graft failure, and it's remained there. Um, infection also is there. 
and uh, multi organ failure was here. So, just a local view at, at, our, uh, at our country. So, the number, total number of heart transplant between 1986, this was until 2017. This is the report I found in the, uh, in the Scott uh, website. So, around 367 uh, transplant was done, heart transplant, and 650 uh, of, uh, of heart valve uh, were used during uh, 1993 to 2017. Um, while mainly King Faisal Hospital and Brad Sultan Cardiac Center, uh, during that year, 2017, 35 transplant was done in King Faisal and two was done in uh, Prince Sultan. So let's conclude the lecture. Thank you. Any question or comment? Uh, Faisal, uh, now uh, there is a talk about the uh, 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 donation after circulatory arrest. I, I, read, I don't know a lot about it, but they're saying that it will avoid the uh, cytokine storm uh, that you mentioned with uh, brain death, where mm -hmm. like patients um, that are not really brain dead, but uh, severe brain injury mm -hmm. and uh, so they they so until they arrest they allow arrest and they check the vitals after 15 minutes mm -hmm. and uh, after that they uh, basically put the patients uh, on uh, uh, like ECMO I believe I don't know that but it's interesting uh, uh, type of donor I think in the UK they're doing it yeah I don't have any uh, comments on that or uh, yeah yeah I came across some many study. Uh, describing this uh, technique and also with the advance as we said organ care system this is provi provide probably a good outcome with those patients uh, there is some report with different outcome i don't think it's standardized so still yeah. maybe need further uh, studies first of all is warm ischemic time well الحين انت لخبطتنا <laughs> and the Arab cold is chemical, the warm, I'm not sure. Warm is uh, while you're perfusing the heart. So, in the case of, of organ care system, you don't have uh, cold ischemic time. All your time is uh, warm ischemia. Patient already is uh, being uh, reperfused. Mm -hmm. uh, Again, a question, Ali, and that's warm or cold ischemia, but. I couldn't find any specific definition. Dr. Farid? Uh, yes, I'll come back one slide. Sure. Another one. So what's your interpretation of this graph? By the way, Ani, this is an excellent presentation. Uh, this is what we expect you to, to I mean, the way you talk about and the, uh, the wrapping of the topic and the coverage of all the points uh, when you talk about the uh, people who are graduating uh, and I'm presenting their uh, cases. The only thing against this is the, the timing. Of course, you took about an, half an hour or an hour and a half or like either. Uh, so I, if I were you, I would try to uh, take the same topic but reduce it uh, uh, focus on some only one or two areas and reduce it to 15 minutes. That will be a perfect topic for graduation. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you will be I mean, giving the chance to talk about transplant, but it will be a very good uh, review for all the residents. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dixon. So, how do you uh, interpret this uh, graph? <clears throat> so, this is the cumulative end, uh, incidence of uh, leading cause of death. And, and Y axis, we have incidence of cause uh, specific death. And in uh, Y axis, we have uh, time, years, five years. Um, so we can see the, the top on the list came the graft failure, it's either early or late, and it's increasing uh, over time. Well, if you look at the, uh, the three most important uh, factors for mortality, um, mm -hmm. Early on and later on as well. Both, all of them are still the same. They start 
they, they are very important in the early stage, in the, in the first three months, but also they are very important on the long term for those patients. The same three factors. Mm -hmm. But there is some difference in the graphs of, um, uh, let's say, let's look at infection versus graft failure. How do you interpret that? Infection and graft failure. Um, so early on, uh, it's, uh, start uh, following almost the same curve. However, after uh, maybe three years, uh, the lines start to divert from each other with higher... Uh, Does that signify? Mm, I don't have a B value or confidence interval, so... Well, the, the, the thing I want you to realize is that all of them come here in the first three months are very uh, huge, but the, uh, the infection is not that significant in the first three months. It gradually goes up. It becomes very significant by the first year, but then after that, it's almost stable, almost stable. Yes, there is a, an infection rate, but it is uh, almost flat, while the, uh, while the graft failure is progressive. Throughout the year, the longer they live, the worse the uh, the chances of uh, graft uh, failure. Uh -huh. Infection after the first year is almost I mean, um, it becomes irrelevant. The first three months, um, uh, the first actually one or two months is uh, it's very significant, but it's the highest is at, at the time of one year. All of these, of course, are important because this will mount about what seventy percent, eighty percent of your mortality right there. Okay, and the rest of it is here. But here you have a flat line or almost flat for infection. So yes, there is an instance of infection every year, one or two, or like either. it depends on your population. But it's definitely the heart failure related, the graft failure is the, the, the one that's taking the lead. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, there was another one that you mentioned. Um, can you show the early, very earlier graphs? Uh, you showed something there. I can't remember what it was. It uh, you made a comment, which I thought is um, <clears throat> every one of you guys should be really uh, critical about uh, professing. Um, uh, yeah, here. And this graph here, in this graph, mm -hmm. it's, it's important to, um, let me just see, what was it here? 10 years experience of uh, extended criteria. Okay. The, and he showed those two differences between the two graphs, but you have not shown the, the, uh, the, um, the natural history. If you show the natural history, this will be very, uh, very beneficial to the patients. Mm -hmm. This will be very beneficial. Yes, it has a higher mortality compared to the uh, perfect technique, let's say, but then a uh, perfect selection, but it, it's definitely, even with this, it's better than the natural history. And that's why we would take marginal hearts from time to time. Um, there was another one also. Uh, go, go ahead, uh, go uh, not for further, go backward. Huh? Yeah, this one. What did you say? What did you say here? Uh, I said that uh, there is many critiques about the new uh, donor uh, allocation system. The two, and the, they studied the previous uh, system with the, compared with the new system regarding. Uh, to survival for the first one year or 200 day. And yeah, they showed the, the mortality in the waiting list decreased a little bit, but the outcome was uh, still not good for uh, those patients because you already, you are doing a transplant for more sick patients. I can't remember, there was a point I wanted to mention. But anyway, uh, what would you do if you drop the heart on the floor in the OR with the recipient home bypass. Wash, wash the heart and, and use it. Yeah, this is <laughs> <laughs> Has, it Has it been reported? Uh, uh, yeah, yes, yes. Okay, I have not, I have not uh, came across it. Uh, there may be some report. I did come, I did live through uh, one actually, which is kidney transplant. And the, and the kidney fell on the floor. The, uh, it was picked up and washed and, and used, and the patient did very well. So you were talking about transplanting patients with active infection in the drive line and how much we, risk we take for those patients. This is a, another situation where you may be faced. Hopefully, you will not face it, 
because you'll be very careful about handling this uh, organ and preventing all the potential, all the chances of dropping it on the floor by using deeper uh, 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 cans and, 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 uh, and kind of uh, containers so it will not fall on the side or like you know. But anyway, I thought it's inter interesting to mention. You can those who mentioned that it was reported before can send us a report. Allah, shukran. Dr. Farid, can I ask what's the difference between the warm and uh, cold ischemic time? So, uh, any, any abnormal um, fusion is uh, ischemic to the heart. So any abnormal kind of um, not normal circulation is, will definitely inflict some Okay, uh, Cold ischemia is when you put the cross clamp and you remove the cross clamps in the OR, that's total uh, ischemic time. And by the way, I don't use, I personally do not use a second dose of cardioplegia because usually the patient have very good dose of um, uh, cardioplegia that can last for four to six hours. So especially if I'm happy with the timing, yani if the heart comes in within two or three hours, I think I can do the transplant within an hour. So it's not a big um, issue for me to give a second dose of cardioplegia. And I, uh, I, I actually, there are some reports of that repeated cardioplegia of the current ones that we use, which is the custodial, may be harmful to the, to the heart. Anyway, but I do use it if I have a certain concern about the timing. I reach five hours of, uh, of ischemic time or more, and, uh, and it, it becomes an issue, then I would be prepared for the worst scenario. Um, the, the warm ischemia is the heart is being perfused. It's being, it's being perfused with blood and nutrient in that blood. So it's not really a total ischemia, but because it's abnormal circulation, it does inflict some ischemia. And that's why it's labeled as ischemia. There's a short period of, um, or a short period of um, uh, cold ischemia or total ischemia for that heart well, when you get it out of the patient and put it on the machine. Um, and, and again, when you take it from the machine and put it in the patient, so there are a short period here and there which can be managed with, with cardioplegia. But the, the total times, like the other one we mentioned, uh, he mentioned earlier, 10 hours or more, they said you can do this uh, hard for even up to uh, a few days. Um, uh, they talk about 24 hours is the average, um, well, not the average, but the recommended time to use the heart within 24 hours. The, the, the most important advantage of this is that we can do now uh, LVAD more easier uh, because it takes sometimes six hours, four hours to take the heart out um, uh, in an LVAD case. It's very uh, uh, difficult, Yani. Yeah. We may take it even piecemeal, you know, very small pieces at a time. Um, it's a very difficult uh, adhesive uh, situation. Um, so that's one situation it will help when you are bringing the heart from a far away. Um, uh, I I personally do not prefer to bring a heart from far away um, for redos, for example, and for um, for LVADs. Uh, I, I don't uh, I don't do that. But with this device now, I can yes, I can go ahead and, and do that uh, and accept the risk with this. Uh, okay. how how can we measure the peak oxygen consumption? Uh, they put the patient in exercise. Uh, you mean the VMAX? Ahsen, you mean the VMAX? Yes. Yeah, they put the patient in exercise. This is especially for patients who can't tolerate. Uh, so on the bicycle and the, or treadmill, and at the same time they are measuring, they put the, like a kind of face mask and measuring, uh, correlating the oxygen and uh, the, uh, the al-juhd, yani. Same time. Uh, one addition, uh, in case of uh, prolonged ischemia time, uh, I read that each half an hour post uh, six hour, and you let add the six first six hour, each uh, 30 minutes will increase the early post operative mortality by 8%. So, yeah, this to consider as well. And uh, the, about the question that uh, Ayat raised, um, the virtual uh, cross-match 
we do not use anything from the donor yet. Uh, so we have, uh, we have a, a pool of uh, population, patients population, uh, community population in our own country here. And we have uh, decided on those, uh, those are the antigens that's most uh, available in our community. And those uh, antigens are, um, are uh, implanted on a small plastic uh, peds. Um, and they are uh, designed and they're given to us as such. You take it from the shelf. It's already labeled as antigen XYZ. Antigens the ones that are known, A and B. Um, and you take the donor, uh, sorry, you take the recipient blood, try to see if it has any antibodies against those antigens. And you do it in the test tube, okay? So once you do that, you know that this patient is likely to have those uh, kind of antibodies. But you still have to do the real, uh, real uh, cross-match. The virtual is very good, but we still have to do the real cross-match uh, sometimes the virtual tells us that the patient is um, having antibodies against this and this. And, and when we do it in the real situation, it's not. So um, some people, people are lucky because they are slightly different than the um, uh, uh, patients from the population. Mm -hmm. Anyway, some, I send you the article on that. Uh, so for you, if you want to read it, it's, um, it's a nephrology article, but it's common for uh, the antigen antibodies is common for all uh, practices. Sure. Father Shaitani, do you have a question today? Yes, there is another question. I'm going to ask you a little bit about the time. Thank you, Dr. Faisal. Amazing. It's a great deal. 